This tutorial covers um, so-called master models. I have introduced master models in code to be able to describe um, optical constants which are not really constant because they change their values um, by an external parameter like the temperature or also because the material changes its or is produced with different stoichiometries, different compositions. For cases like this, a master model can follow the changes of the optical properties of materials and that can be very practical. And uh, I thought it would be good to give you an example which really shows how practical it can be. And uh, I will use code in a so-called presentation mode to show you different um, pages of a little talk that I gave at the conference once. So what I will do now, I will load a so-called code presentation. I can do that. I will show you what that means. I will do that here, presentation, load, and code presentations have the extension CPR, and here is the one that I want to use, and I open it. And then a page like this loads, and actually if we take a look at the tree view, once you have loaded a presentation, you have at the very bottom here of the tree view a list called presentation, and if you right-click that, you will see a list uh, which shows screenshots of different code configurations and basically a presentation is only a simple list of one code page or one code configuration uh, loaded after another one. So you can jump from one to the next one with some keyboard commands and basically that's it. So if we press F7 and we go to, to the full screen mode here and then press the keyboard key P for presentation mode. Then code is in this presentation mode. I can switch off the status bar. And then we are basically in a mode where it looks like a little bit like PowerPoint. With the keys page up and page down, I can jump from one configuration to the next and backwards. And uh, here is the, the start of the actual content. Um, in order to explain what master models are and how they are used, I have um, prepared a solution for a touch display problem that was once brought to me by one of my customers. Um, they had a certain design problem, optical design problem, and they had already a candidate material that could be uh, eventually solving that problem, and that is molybdenum oxide, and um, they did already a systematic variation of the oxygen content, and they found that the optical constants are quite different depending on how much oxygen you incorporate into the layers. So the question was um, what a stoichiometry should be used best for this solution and how thick should the layer be. And uh, that's an ideal a starting situation to develop um, a master model, and that's what I did. And then the design is basically just a piece of cake. And I will show you also how to use a working master model also for simplified production control. Okay, let's take a look at the at the problem. Um, this is a problem from the uh, from the disk from display technology. Uh, my customers produced uh, ITO layers on, the co on coning substrates, and there's a backside material, which is not too relevant for, for this discussion here. And uh, the main area of the display is just covered by this layer stack, coning substrate, ITO layer, roughly 160 nanometer thick, and the backside material. But uh, in addition to this main uh, viewing area of the display, there are little contact sections where they need a high conductivity and the ITO is not conductive enough. So um, in these bridges, they use aluminum uh, instead of ITO 
just because it has a much higher uh, connectivity. And uh, unfortunately, the aluminum bridges here are clearly visible. The reflectivity is close to 90% in the visible, whereas the ITO layer here has a reflectance of a few percent only. So this is uh, dark, a little bit grayish, and this, is, this appears to be uh, bright and almost white. So the, the task now is to put a layer in between the Corning substrate and the aluminum layer here uh, that would act as an anti-reflection uh, coating. So it would reduce the high reflectivity of the aluminum to a level so that the bridges are not visible anymore. And they already found that molybdenum oxide uh, should work, but it was not really clear what thickness and what stoichiometry uh, stoichiometry uh, would be suitable to solve this design um, goal, to get this design goal. Okay, um, first things first, uh, before I did a reasonable analysis of um, the molybdenum oxide layers that they produced, um, I had to develop a model for the Corning glass substrate here, these are the reflectance spectra from both sides and the transmission. And I showed you already in a previous tutorial about handling glass substrates, how we can do this. Here, I just adapted the, my favorite float glass model, and it just works. So then the Corning sub substrate is known, and I have analyzed various layers of molybdenum oxide on the Corning substrate. Actually, they produce layers in a systematic way by uh, changing the oxygen flow during the position. And I used the batch mode of code in order to analyze all these spectra. I will show you in a moment the results. We just go to, um, to all these steps they started with an oxygen flow of 3.5 times 10 to the minus 4 millibar. And these are the optical spectra in red, the measured data, film side reflectance, glass side reflectance, transmittance in the middle. And uh, this is the, the blue curves show the model fit. Here you can see the transmission is almost zero. And here you see the optical constants. I modeled those optical constants by uh, a superposition of a constant, an OJL model for the interband transition in the UV, um, a Drude model for the free charge carriers, and in addition, I used a so-called Kim oscillator for um, actually this broad feature here in the middle of the visible, which is related, well, it's not really clear what it is. It could be a broad interband transition as well, or it could be uh, isolated charge carriers which cannot really move through the whole material, so they are confined in certain regions of high um, conductivity, and they are blocked by regions with, which have a very low conductivity, so they cannot easily move through that barrier. That would lead to a high polarizability and uh, that can be described by a, a very broad so-called Kim oscillator, which I used. For all of the oxidation states, I used the same model. That is important. And let's go to the next one, to a little bit higher oxygen flow, 4.5. The transmission gets a little bit higher. The optical constants here have, have a lower imaginary part, and that continues. 5.5 times 10 to the minus 4 millibars, 6.5, 7.5, and 8.5. This is not really a transparent oxide, but it's almost a transparent oxide. It's a little bit like, like ITO itself. So let's take a look at the uh, so-called batch control window. We have to go to the tree view inside and take a look at batch control. And here I just show you 
a table. Actually, it would be good to reformat the results um, by selecting the block and then format the cells. OK. Um, so what we see here is for different samples, the oxygen flow as a parameter here above, the, um, the um, input files with the spectra, and here the results for all the fit parameters, and here you can see the fit deviation. But basically here we have a table of um, parameter values versus oxygen flow during production. And this is the basis for a master model. Uh, basically, we can now use this table and uh, do a simple linear interpolation between those two values and do that for every parameter. And then we can generate basically uh, a model for, for, for example, an oxygen flow of 4.0, although we have never produced it. Uh, this simple linear interpolation should work if we have smooth transitions from 3.5 to 4.5 and so on. And uh, this is very easy to, to make uh, linear interpolation here, and that's basically what the master model does. Instead of linear interpolations, you can do it a little bit more advanced if you like, doing uh, polynomial interpolations of, of any kind that can be as complex as you like. But in this case, I just use linear interpolation, and that works actually in, for most problems very nicely. So once you have done that, you have a, a very flexible model. And I show you how that works. Uh, then you just have two parameters. Uh, when you introduce the entire reflection layer here between the corning substrate and aluminum, you have the oxygen rate, the oxygen flow during production of that layer. You can see here how the optical constants change. If I change this model, it's a smooth transition from metallic to more and more dielectric behavior. And as a second parameter, you have the, the layer thickness here. And here in this graph, I show a visualization of the color. This is the color of the main area of the display, the ITO covered area here. And this is the color of the um, aluminum spots, the aluminum bridges, including the anti-reflection layer. And uh, what you can see here, we can almost have it disappear with a certain combination of oxygen flow and layer thickness. And I have done this uh, systematically, uh, and the de design task is now, um, well, set target values for the reflectivity. This layer stack here should have the same reflectivity as this layer stack, and it should have the same color. Uh, sorry, with reflectivity, I mean the same light reflectance. That's the average reflectance in the visible. And it should have the same A star and B star values characterizing the color of the stack. The ITO layer has about 6% average reflectivity in the visible. A star is 0 0.7 and B star is minus, roughly minus 21. That's bluish, what, that's what we see here. And um, our layer stack here has right now 18.5% and the wrong A star and B star values. Well, we can now do uh, a systematic variation of both parameters. I do that uh, with a so-called grid fit, 100 st uh, 10 steps, uh, test values for the oxygen flow and 20 for the thickness. We do that in two dimensions. So we test 200 values and then we do the downhill, downhill simplex finalization. And that should work pretty quick. If I start the fit, um, we should be at a good solution in a few seconds. And actually, for this layer stack, 
that's the best solution, about 67 nanometers with an oxygen flow of 5.6. And then, actually, the, the bridges are, well, they can be seen a little bit, but they are um, quite similar to the, uh, to the main area, the ITO-covered area. And since this was so easy, I thought, well, let's do it a little bit more complex and maybe also with a slightly better result. It's really simple for one layer, so we can also do it for two layers. So I extended this layer stack, this anti-reflection stack, actually to a two-layer system where we can have two molybdenum oxide layers on top of each other with high oxygen rate or high oxygen content um, at the top and a low oxi lower oxygen content in the bottom here, close to the aluminum. And uh, if we let this optimization run, uh, I hope you can see that the bridges now completely disappear. They cannot be seen on at least on my screen anymore, and the the color values here are really very, very close. So this is a, an, actually an excellent solution for having the bridges disappear, and uh, by just a two-layer system, the oxygen flows are not very far from each other, so they just make a little gradient, uh, smooth, smoother transition from the corning substrate to the aluminum. So that was quite easy, and we have solved a rather complex problem by um, developing this powerful master model for molybdenum oxide. Actually, once you produce, uh, you have to check. Once you produce the, the layer system, the double layer system, you have to check each layer if it has the right stoichiometry and the right thickness. And that is also quite easy if you have uh, a master model, because even if you can measure only a single spectrum, let's say in production, there is not space for reflectance or you don't want to make it so complicated, you just do a simple transmittance measurement, uh, like the red curve here, then uh, it's very clear uh, there's only one combination of thickness and stoichiometry that will really work uh, very good, so if you have the wrong stoichiometry, you will never be able to get the right transmission curve. So you can do this two-parameter fit within a few seconds, one or two seconds, and then you know both the stoichiometry and the thickness of your thin film, and then you know exactly if you produce the, the right type of molybdenum oxide. That was this, this demonstration of the, of the master model and how you use it for design and production control. And um, well, I would like to close this uh, tutorial by showing you another example. And I, actually, I will just show you the, the result. Uh, that is important for many of my customers producing architectural glass coatings. They use a so-called blocker layer or silver protection layer in order to protect an important silver layer for their products. And usually you use nickel chromium, and that is uh, deposited by metallic sputtering without any oxygen flow usually. And then the very thin metallic nickel chromium oxi uh, layer oxidizes a little bit during the production process, and in the end, in the final product, it should be more or less fully oxidized. And for this transition uh, from the metallic nickel chromium to the fully oxidized nickel chromium oxide, I also made a master model. I asked one of my customers to produce all the states in between from pure metallic to fully oxidized, and I adapted the master model, and that's what I deliver with my optical constant database. And if we go to the section that starts with N, we find the nickel chromium blocker here. And if we open that material, and uh, well, we can restrict ourselves to the range 250 to 2,500 nanometers with a few hundred points only. 
and then we can display the optical constants from 0 to 10. And uh, in order to show you the variation from the metallic to the dielectric behavior, I just introduce as a fit parameter the oxygen content of this nickel chromium material, and I give it a range from 0 to 1. And then I use the slider command here to generate a small uh, slider, which is on top of everything. And then I can open the optical constants of the nickel chromium. And I just keep on pressing this little button here to increase the oxygen content. And you can just watch a kind of movie how we go from a, a metallic behavior to a more and more oxidized state. If I increase the oxygen content of this nickel chromium material, you see very slowly the absorption vanishes more and more in the infrared. And in the end, this looks a little bit like looks a little bit like titanium dioxide, actually, or tin oxide. With uh, it's not really completely absorption free. There's still a significant absorption. But since we only have a 2 or 1 nanometer layer, typically the absorption does not really hurt for the optical design too much. Thank you for your patience listening or watching this video. Bye-bye for today.